So here is my plan for today. I will present you our latest paper together, joint with Larry, uh, where we kind of follow up on this connection between the growth and, and, and information processing. Uh, and then, depending on, on how it goes and, and the timing, either I can finish what I didn't finish yesterday, or I may sacrifice it and show you on the board what is called the posterior approach to, to rational attention, uh, because I have uh, recalled that actually the, the intellectual roots of that are from here, from Jerusalem. So the, the intellectual roots of, 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 of a very strong analytical uh, framework that is helpful for rational attention uh, have origins in the work of Oman and Masher that have happened here. So perhaps, uh, perhaps you guys should know about it and you should learn about it exactly at this place. Uh, that might happen later. So this is <coughs> going to be, again, a paper which uh, emphasizes analogies, mathematical analogies between stochastic growth and some information processing. We just take the application more seriously to make it a little bigger. Uh, so we made different applied points. And then we arrived to, to a more complex model of cognition that we didn't know about before we started. But that model of cognition turns out to be important in cognitive sciences and in machine learning. Uh, and I think uh, you should know about it. So, so Mike and Rava know about it. They, they worked about it. Mike will talk about it. I find it exciting. It is a, a model of cognition that allows us to think about uh, uh, some degrees of lack of uh, base rationality in a disciplined manner, and that, that, that might be uh, noteworthy. In this paper, we take stochastic growth in a, in a, in a, from, from a large distance. We think of stochastic growth as a multiplication of random variables. And now, once you think about stochastic growth uh, in such an abstract way, it may have very distinct applications that rhetorically really do not look very similar. So in economics, you might be interested in accumulation of wealth. Uh, and wealth is just a product of random returns. But in a very semi seemingly different domain, in statistics, you might be interested in the likelihood of a sample. Well, likelihood of a sample is just a product of likelihoods of uh, individual data points. Each data point is random, so those individual likelihoods are, again, random variables. So again, you are end up multiplying random variables. In both of these contexts, you are thinking about policies that maximize the growth rate of this process. So in economics, uh, you might end up thinking about, say, redistribution policies in society, and then you want to the wealth, aggregate wealth to grow as quickly as possible. In statistics, you are thinking about different hypotheses that will lead to a quick growth rate of, of the likelihood of a sample, or at least the likelihood of a sample shouldn't decay too quickly. And so since you are maximizing growth rate in some space of policies, it is natural that some general consistency principles will, will uh, arise that will apply across those domains. So in a general uh, sense, the, the principle is not easy to understand. So what we find is that the optimal policy, the one that maximizes the growth rate in any of those two domains, seeks in some sense to be clarified consistency with the outcomes this policy generates. But let me translate this into those domains and then may have perhaps this will be a little bit more informative. So in economics what we find in, in, in the case of wealth accumulation is that a policy that, that <coughs> maximizes the growth of the economy uh, will also satisfy some sort of meritocracy fairness principle. It seeks some consistency between the wealth allocation and the degrees of merits of how people have contributed the growth. So that happens to be a, a property of an optimal policy. In the area on the boundary of statistics, cognition, and machine learning, where, which is sometimes called predictive coding literature, uh, it's been understood that systems which are bad, well adapted to, 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 to process sensory information predict sensory information and try to predict those as consistently as they, as they can, given some restrictions. These things turn out to be uh, mathematically equivalent. So I will start with kind of an applied economic questions. Again, we will pretend to be macroeconomists. Uh, once I will formulate the main result, and I will start to talk about the reasons behind it. The paper turns from, from applied macroeconomics to information theory. And that really is a bridge to get me to the cognition. I, I'm most interested in this part. It was, it's, this project was a random path for us to understand uh, an influential cognition model from outside of an economics. So, so this is where I'm, and this is the part of the talk I'm, I'm looking forward to. Uh, but let me start with, 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 with macro. So be there a finite set of individuals. This time, again, time is discrete. 
And the social planner would like to, to maximize the, the, the growth of this economy, and the tool that the social planner will have will be redistribution of the wealth. So at the every evening of every period, the social planner will confiscate all our wealth and redistribute it in the morning of the next period according to, to a policy that we call an allocation, which is just a probability distribution on the set of players. And the allocation says that Tomas will get two-thirds of the, of the wealth, of the wealth in the morning, and I will get only one-third. So in that case, the, the distribution will be two-thirds for Tomas, one-third for me. It could be any such distribution on the set of players. Now, across the day, across every day, both Tomas and me are productive, and our wealth that we have gotten in the morning is multiplied by some returns. And these returns are heterogeneous across people, so the function of return that determines how what the return of Tomasz and me may, may be different, depends on our names, but also depends on some random shocks. So maybe Tomasz is more productive. On usual day, there might be occasional days when I get a shock that is better than, 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 than of the Tomasz. This, this, this parameter is, again, a random variable, I distributed from some objective uh, distribution known to the social planner. Uh, this, the, oh, yes, so this is a this is a this is a macro shock, but since these functions are can determine that depend on the macro shock in any way, it is for example possible that our returns are correlated or not correlated. This is all uh, allowed by, 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 by this setting. Good question. Thank you for, for the question. So the problem of the social planner then is to choose an allocation, this redistributive policy, from a set of feasible policies. So it might be the case that social norms entitle too much to the two-thirds of the wealth, or maybe the social norms prevent the social planner from too unequal uh, uh, redistribution. Whatever such constraint you, you, you want to think is natural, you can formalize it by some set of these allocation policies that are feasible to the social planner. Within that set, uh, for any given day with the shock omega, that allocation policy, Mr. I gets this much in the morning, this is her return to sum of across people, this is the aggregate return, the logarithm return turns it into the growth rate, and because the shocks are random, you take an expectation, and this is the long run uh, growth rate of the society, this is what the social planner would like to maximize. So that's the social planner's problem. Uh, this is a bit of a simplified setting relative to the, to the paper. From the applied point of view, it's important to endogenize the returns because if I reallocate a lot of wealth, this might have implications to incentives. Maybe, maybe those who are redistributed from will not work as hard, so maybe these returns should be endogenous, and they are in the paper. Let me keep them exogenous for, for explicit in this presentation. I'm one slide away from the main result in this applied part of this uh, paper, where the main result says uh, the policy that maximizes the growth rate necessarily have to be also the most fair policy in a sense that it minimizes a wedge between some notion of merits that those individuals have and how much wealth they get. So for, to formulate the result, they have to define merit. So here is a definition of merit that will work for the result. I will just uh, pick up a dollar from aggregate wealth at a random period. And I'm yeah. not sure the microphone is working. Something turned off. It did. Thank you. So maybe I, I'm playing with the bottom. In the, in the is it now better? OK, thank you. So. Here is how I define this merit distribution. I pick up a dollar at the random period and ask who has produced this dollar. It's random. Uh, and sometimes it was Tomasz, sometimes uh, Rava, sometimes me. And the probability of me or, or any of these people producing a random dollar from the aggregate wealth at a random period is how we define the merit. So what is it? Given shock omega, Mr. I got this much in the morning. This was her return. So this is her wealth in the evening. The denominator is the aggregate wealth in the evening, so this would be the probability of a random dollar being produced by Mr. I at a day with a shock omega, and then you take an expectation with respect to shock. So this is how we define the merits. And so here is the main result, which we call the naive merit or meritocracy principle, which says that the gross optimal allocation, the policy that determines how the wealth is distributed to, to maximize the wealth, turns out to be most fair policy in the following sense. So pick the gross optimal allocation. That's, we know here is the star that, that denotes the, the optimality. 
compute the merit distribution for that policy, fix that merit distribution, this is how much Tomas is useful under the optimal policy, I am useful, etc. And then look throughout all this set of feasible allocations, and it must be the one that, mi that the one that minimizes the wedge, the Kulpa-Gleiber divergence between this merit distribution and the allocation policy must be the optimal one, must be the one that you have started with. So my phone is down again, but I'm seeing directly the recorded. So. Uh, I can push the button again. Uh, do you guys hear me in the back? To some extent, okay. Uh, I will push the button, uh, and if once you will hear less than you want to hear, then you tell me. Uh, Okay, so maybe, maybe you tell the gentleman. Uh, so let me emphasize, there was nothing exactly in the problem that would be saying that this wedge should be minimized. The, the original, the actual motivation of the social planner is to maximize growth rate of wealth. It is a necessary condition of an optimal allocation that it also somehow, somehow tries to minimize the, the wedge between the merit and, and, and who gets what. Uh, we call the principle naive because the merit, merit distribution is fixed to the one induced by the growth optimal allocation. And the way the merits are defined, the merit distribution depends not only on how productive we are, but also how well we are treated, how much we get in the morning. So the merit distribution bundles two things together. Uh, so somehow the merits go yeah, on and on. Sorry, no problem. Uh, so let me go on shouting and then we will get to, to the new technology. So, so the merit distribution, the bundles two things. The people who are well treated by the society given a policy get a lot. Well, they produce many dollars, but also it reflects how productive those people are. So now if you were to, to change an allocation, that would be changing the merit distribution. But this fairness optimization doesn't take that into account. It takes the merit distribution as fixed, as if it was fixed on the, on the optimal allocation, and asking if this was the merit distribution, which one would be the, the which, which allocation would be the closest to it. Yes, please. Can you interpret this as sort of equilibrium condition? This is a fixed point. This is uh, an equilibrium, because uh, uh, the, 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 the merit distribution is an endogenous object which, which depends on the allocation, and then given that merit distribution, the, the allocation has to be kind of most fair uh, to it. So indeed, you are you are right to point out that this is this is a fixed implicit fixed point characterization of the of the policy. Can there be multiple such fixed points? Uh, there there could be in non-generic cases where uh, you say uh, you, if, if we impose a lot of symmetry, if we are always equally productive, then there would be trivial multiplicity. Uh, but generically, but generically there is a uniqueness. And by the way, so let me just add, uh, you can find the, this fixed point uh, by naive iterations. You can start with any allocation. Interiors, so there are some problems on the, on the on, on if, you, if you start on the boundary of the simplex, but start with any policy compute, the merits. You find out that the one that you've started aren't the most fair one given the merits they have in you. So try to get closer, the merits change try to get closer, this, this uh, naive, uh, this, this myopic process will converge to the optimal so one. It, it, is it, you got a contraction map? Is that why? It, it is not a contraction mapping. That would be, this would be an implication of some general result from, from information geometry. Okay. Um. Yes, please. I have another general question on the maximization problem of the social planner. I think you briefly mentioned that. Um, yeah, this is now, um, can you explain again what you mean by a long one? Because this is now time independent, so there's... Right, right. So the, the implicitly, the policy is assumed to be stationary. Mm -hmm. You could ask, can the non-stationary policy do any better? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. So, so this problem, by the way, this problem is up to relabeling and an additional constraint, again, uh, again, uh, equivalent to, to what Kelly was studying when he was optimizing uh, 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 financial portfolios. So this is like Kelly's betting with an additional constraint that some portfolios might not be feasible to you. And so they understood very well uh, why this, op this, this, uh, this objective might be a reasonable objective. 
and they have a result which we extended for the existence of this constraint, saying that even if you are allowed to do something non-stationary, uh, given that the shocks are RID, the stationary policy happens to be the optimal one. All right, so let me, let, let me just illustrate this, uh, just to, to, to make sure that we understand the result. For the simplicity of an example, uh, scrap away uncertainty, so let the state space be a singleton, and so let's have five individuals, and to economize the notation, let the index of an individual tell us how Mr. I is productive, so the return of Mr. Five is five, return of Mr. One is one. Of course, you would give everything to Mr. Five if you were to maximize uh, uh, the growth rate, if you were unconstrained, so to make it non-trivial. Assume that there is an inequality constraint. The social planet cannot make the society very unequal. Uh, this just says, this is an entropy function, this says that the the, the allocation has to be close enough to uniform. This also is equivalent to an applied inequality index called teal index. Uh, and we said that because then the, this problem becomes tractable. The gross optimal allocation would give a lot to Mr. Phi, but not everything, because you also need to control this, this extent of inequality. Uh, so even unproductive Mr. Wang gets a tiny bit every morning. Then given how much these people get in the morning, you can ask how much they contribute to the growth. How, what's the probability that a random dollar has been produced by Mr. Five or, or one or, or anybody else? That will be another distribution, a bit more steep than the allocation because Mr. Five not only is very productive, but also treated very well in this society. So he produces a large share of dollars. So this is a bit of a more unequal distribution than the blue one before. And then given that merit function, you can ask, OK, so if those are the contributions of the people to the, the wellness of economy, which allocation is it would be the most fair? And the unconstrained one would be the same as, 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 as this one, but that's not feasible because this is too unequal and the constraint was by binding. So you can ask, within the feasible allocations that satisfies the inequality constraint, which one is closest in terms of Kulberg librarians to this one? You compute that, and the theorem tells you that the, the closest one must be the blue one which you have started with, the one that maximizes the, the growth rate. That's the, that's the result. So with that condition, with the not allowing the Q to be completely peak, then you maximize over any Q. You don't have to choose a capital Q. Uh, right. So, so once, it, once the result says that once you have computed this merit distribution, you must you, you, you optimize across any allocation functions denoted by Q that satisfy this constraint. Yeah, but before your Q was part of a set which you have your curly Q. Yes, and yes, so that is, that is, that is, that is, that set, is, yes, okay, okay, exactly. So that set is yeah, all yeah. Qs that satisfy this constraint in this example. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Uh, are you allowing the Q to be different per person? Can we say like we have, you know, have the leader of this country and his family will always get at least a third. Yeah, so one possibility of this constraint, so, so this curly Q, uh, could be of a form that we have a very uh, important person in the society and it is understood that this person has to get at least this share of the wealth. That would be one. Actually, we impose no structure on, on this constraint. So, so that would, a, any such story would be formalized by, by a calligraphic Uh, all right, so uh, there is a very, ni very nice paper by, by, by a good experimentalist, Peter Andre from Bonn, who was uh, studying uh, experimentally how people want to redistribute wealth. And I think he was a bit disturbed by his own finding. He, he, he nicely called it shallow meritocracy. He figured out that in his kind of semi-field experiment, uh, people... Uh, redistribute money according to some merit judgments, but they do not filter out initial conditions. So people start from different initial conditions. I will not go into the details. The, 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 the observers who are allowed to redistribute the wells in his experiment see and understand those conditions, yet they do not take them into account in their redistributive choices. So we get something of that flavor uh, as, as kind of a, as, 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 as in, in our meritocratic principle where, where this is the naivety that we found. Uh, let me point out that because it is a fixed point, as we discussed, uh, our model implies sensitive comparative statics. So if, if Rava's uh, productivity goes up, 
his merit goes up, that means that he will get more by the social planner if the social planner is trying to maximize growth. But that increases your merit again because the merit reflects not only how productive you are but how well treated you are. So then you should get even more. And that means that this, this echo effect, this, this, this positive feedback loop, means that small changes in productivity may lead to large changes in, in, in the optimal policy. Translated to, to, to finance, this means that if you are optimizing the portfolios to maximize the growth rate of individual wealth, and uh, there is an exogenous cho shock to, to, to the probability of returns of these portfolios, you may react quite a lot. So you may look like, to a naive analyst, as you are overly sensitive to, to, to the shocks in your, in your management or portfolios. So that is kind of an implication of, of, of this fixed point nature of, of the result. That's all I have from the, 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 the applied part of the paper. Now I will talk a little bit about the proof that will be a bit of an information theory. Rav and Mike will recognize immediately in the next result what is called a variational autoencoder, which is something, uh, an algorithm that lives somewhere between machine learning and cognitive sciences. Uh, here in our paper, it, we, we, we kind of figure it out without knowing that literature uh, as an auxiliary problem that characterizes an optimal policy. So here's our main technical result. Uh, where the, the purpose of the result is to find another optimization problem, a solution of which is our gross optimal policy. Now this additional problem looks more complicated, we're adding more controls and making it bigger, uh, and you, you may take some time to, to, to get familiar with it. You two are, must be seeing just from the, 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 the aesthetics of it, uh, the variational autoencoder. So let me be slower for the rest of us. The first trick that we do is that we we take this allocation function qi, we multiply it with the return function, so this is telling me how much Mr. i is getting, is, is the return of Mr. i on the day with the shock omega. And I'm going to call this product, which is yet another function, I'm going to denote it qi omega, and I'm going to pretend that this is a joint distribution of two random variables. It is not negative, so these are two non-negative numbers, so that's good news, it's like I'm not having negative probabilities, that's, that's a good start, but it is not normalized. There is no reason for this to add up to one. So this is not really a joint distribution. Let me call it a generalized joint distribution. Let me ignore the fact that it is not normalized. Let me do things with it that we do with distributions, and turns out it's useful and, and nothing, nothing blows up. So I'm going, to, one thing is that you, in information theory, you might <coughs> treat objects are not distribution as distribution, it might be useful and kosher. Uh, so the result says that the allocation Q star maximizes the growth rate if and only if it also solves some bigger problem, where the bigger problem uh, has an additional control. There is another, some other joint distribution that we haven't seen yet. Some, some joint, this is a true joint distribution which is well normalized. You are controlling the allocation. Each allocation together with these return functions gives you this generalized joint distribution. Let me call this a policy. And then the problem says, well, find me a pair of two joint distributions. One is a policy and not really a distribution. Another is a distribution and we don't know, understand yet what is an interpretation of it. But let's try find a pair which is as consistent as possible. So I'm minimizing the kulpa gleiber divergence between them subject to two constraints. The first one is the old constraint that uh, the allocation has to be feasible. The second constraint says that this new distribution that we don't understand yet has to agree on the margin when I uh, marginalize this with respect to i with the prior distribution of the shocks. Now if you do this, if you solve this problem, it spits out the optimal allocation and additionally this other control variable, this other random variable, will spit out uh, the, the merit distribution. So if you take the optimum of p star i, you marginalize across omega, what you get is the merit distribution that we had before. And that's the technical result. You probably don't understand it well, and I will uh, try to give you an intuition for what this object might be. And then once we are done with it, then actually I will reveal that this doesn't have to be anything about the growth. It, it might not be about, about wealth. 
it, it might be a model of cognition, or actually it is a well-known model of cognition, which is not well-known in economics and should be well-known in economics. All right, so here is an intuition. I'm, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to, 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 to treat it informally, but let, let's try. So I'm going to introduce an idea of money circulation. I'm going to, to track how money flow around this economy. So think of the initial endowment, be there a continuum of dollars given to those people at the beginning of time. Take a dollar from that initial endowment, that's like an infinitesimal part of the initial wealth, and let's call it the mother of a dynasty of dollars. So I, I kind of, I always wanted to be a biologist, so I always uh, we, we end up working with papers <coughs> inspired by, by biological consideration. So, so each initial dollar of the endowment is, 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 a, is a mother of a dynasty, and this, this mother is going to have kids. So when they are in the hands of Mike, and Mike had a good day, so at that particular day, uh, uh, the, the dollars of Mike's are multiplying. I'm thinking, treating that, that return as, 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 as the dollar that Mike is holding as having kids, as having offsprings. Uh, each mother is an infinitesimal piece of initial wealth, so I'm going to assume that all these offsprings and offspring of offsprings, the whole dynasty always travels around the society together. They're moving across people due to their distribution. The social planner is confiscating the wealth at the evening and giving it by a random allocation rule to people. So Mike is getting two thirds, I'm getting one third. So every dynasty at every morning has a probability of two thirds ending in the hands of Mike. So these dynasties travel around, they get to multiply if they are in the hands of Mike, where the Mike has a good day, then they multiply a lot. Sometimes they're in my hands, Mike might have a bad day, and they don't, don't do that well on, on the particular day. So now consider a finite horizon, and define a path of a given dynasty, there is infinitely many of them, as an empirical distribution that tells me how often, given that finite horizon, they have been in the hands of Rava, Mike, or me, and how often they have experienced a particular shock. Most of the dynasties in the long run will be in the hands of Rava or me or Mike. Uh, its frequency is very close to the actual allocation rule. That's the law of large numbers. But there will be such lucky dynasties that will be very often in the hands of Tomasz because Tomasz is a very productive person. Or maybe they will be in the hands of Tomasz on the days where Tomasz is productive. So there will be some dynasties that will, by luck, travel around the society in a way that will that is involves a lot of luck, but also that gives them a large growth rate. Okay. Since the, the shock is aggregate, the eventually all the dynasties on the margin, the path should, be, should agree with the, the prior distribution over the states, but they can be disproportionately often in the hands of people, or they can enjoy by accident some, some lucky correlations of being in the hands of people who have been at the particular given day particularly productive. Now I can ask, for a given pass, I can sum up the wealth of all the dynasties following a particular pass. Think of that as a particular circulation pattern in the society. I can ask, what's the growth rate of this dynasty? How many offspring of offspring, etc., they have? And it turns out that the growth rate is given, it's the minus of this kullback liber divergence. So because this is not a generalized distribution, this, is, this can be uh, a big number, a small number. So the, the can kubek liber divergence with this is generalized distribution can be negative, so this can be a, the minus can, can make it into a positive number. But the, the, the spirit of the message is that the dynast the, the, the paths that are consistent with the policy generate a large growth rate. So those dynasties that kind of move around the society in a way that is close to, to the policy grows quicker. Now what is the total aggregate wealth of the society? Is the sum of the growth rates, is the sum of the wealth of each path. So I'm now summing up exponential functions. Again, when you are summing up exponential functions, you can forget all of them but the one with the largest growth rate. So the, that one will dominate all the others. So what will happen that the, the growth rate of aggregate wealth it grows at the rate which is just maximizing this with respect to the path. So once you fix this, the, the, the policy, let me flip back to my result. Once you fi fix the policy, the growth rate of the of the society will be the one that, that maximizes the minus of this or that minimizes this. And then since I can also choose the policy, the growth rate of the society will be an outcome of the optimization across those two objects when I'm trying to 
kind of maximize the consistency of those two objects. I mean, we are forcing that, that story of replicator dynamics because we are inspired by, 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 by biological evolutionary stories. Uh, what, what we have done is that we have some stochastic growth rate. Right? We have decomposed that into many, many stochastic growth rate with different long-run growth rates. And then we say, well, it's the one with the highest growth rate that, that, that kind of dominates, and, and this is what we are doing. So yes, in some sense, it is similar to ideas with replicator dynamics, but it is a, it is a different framework. It's, it's not entirely the same. Uh, OK, so that's, the, that's, that's what I managed to convey as, as an intuition. And now I'm in the part of, the, of, of this paper which will reveal that, that actually that, that auxiliary problem has been well known in, in other disciplines and uh, will reveal the reasons why we think uh, that economists should, should look into it. Uh, so now I'm in the part that I will, I will, uh, I will introduce under the name of predictive coding. Then I have learned from, from Rava that it is also called the variational autoencoder, which is kind of a nerdy name for a particle algorithm used in, in machine learning. We were more inspired by cognitive literature, and, and they do the same thing. They are very influenced by machine learning. Uh, uh, but they, they call it predictive coding. So be there a system. If you are a Rava, this system is brain, or a person, or mice. If you are a machine learning person, this system is, is, a, is a machine. And this system is, is sampling signals from fixed objective distribution P0. And uh, <coughs> the system is not so much interested into the signal. The system would like to form a belief about the correlate of the signal denoted here by I, and I'm going to call it a cause, but it's, it's not really a causal relationship. I is somehow correlated with omega, so if you observe omega, you should be able to learn to, to, to form beliefs about I, but the system is not endowed with a joint, with a, with a prior, so it doesn't know the joint distribution of I and omega, and has to learn it from the, from the data. Uh, let me, for simplicity, assume that the system knows the likelihoods for each I, for each cause, sometimes this is called the latent variety, for each cause, the system knows the, the conditional probability distribution over omega. Now, Mike and, and, and Rava could be disappointed because this is not what happens in out variational outlook encoders. I do this here only because I fix the returns, and this object will be equivalent to our returns. So this doesn't need to be fixed. Okay? Uh, the only thing that the system doesn't know in, in this example is the prior distribution over these causes, but it entertains a set of possible priors. So it, it thinks that not all the priors are, are possible. And so now notice that once you take a prior from this set, since it knows the, the, the likelihood, you would know the joint distribution. You would then know the prior over the pairs, and you could do the Bayesian updating. So the only thing it has to do is to pick a prior, and it's good to go. Uh, and so each prior here corresponds to a probability distribution over the signals omega. So you can think of each prior as indexing a hypothesis. So I started my previous lecture with, with uh, some asymptotic uh, statistical learning. So think of each prior as, as, as generating a, a marginal distribution of signals. You are trying to choose a prior that will generate the marginal distribution of signals as close as possible from the true distribution. Or at least this is what you would end up doing if you are a maximum likelihood estimation, econometrician, and you observe a lot of data, or a Bayesian statistician. So the system is going to choose the best fit, a prior from the set of priors that it deems possible, that minimize the Kuhlberg-Leiber divergence between the, the objective signal distribution and the induced signal distribution. Uh, this is what is assumed in machine learning. In fact, uh, a person working on, 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 on uh, misspecified learning would think of this as, as being a result. So this is an asymptotic outcome of, of, of statistical learning. The machine learning literature doesn't bother to, to relate to those other results. They would just say that the system tries to minimize some measure of surprise, and then they would hand wave and say that this is a measure of surprise. It's not an easy exercise to, to read machine learning papers, I must say. Now, once the system would do that and would pick up a prior that kind of fits the data the best, the system is good to go, could form the, the, the Bayesian beliefs. So 
given the signal omega, it would now form a conditional belief about the goals. And this is what the system was really up to. This is what we want. So this is how we economists would think about it. And when I spoke about it with Rava and first time presenting, he would say, no, 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 this is not how it's being done, because Rava comes from machine learning. And so this is how it's done in, in, in actual machines. So I, uh, I tell you how it's done in actual machines. And then the cognitive scientist hand wave, and they say that this is also how it's done in a brain, it's a model of a brain. So those literature would say, well, this is intractable for two reasons. It's difficult to find this best fit, and it's difficult to Bayesian updating. This is computationally difficult. And they say, if, if you, you. Yeah, just since it's a cognitive model, how should we think of this assumption of people knowing the, all the likelihood? <coughs> uh, right, so this is a simplifying assumption that I have done. It, it helps me to simplify some results I want to show you, and it fits the assumption that the returns in my corresponding macro model were fixed. But in fact, in the paper, we allow for the returns to be endogenous, which then corresponds for the system not knowing those likelihoods. Then what happens is that the system uh, considers a set of joint distributions that it deems feasible, and is choosing from that set of joint distribution the one, the marginal distribution of signals is closest to the true distribution of the signals. Uh, Right, so 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 the, the mathematical answer of this is that uh, you know, the, the the system doesn't need to know that this is an example. Thank you. All right, so this is how 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 those other scientists do this. They would say so. What I'm going to introduce will lead to an equivalent solution of of the problem that I have set up. So I'm not setting up something. It will look very different. At the end, it solves the same problem. So they would introduce two models. One they would call a generative model. And this is really the joint distribution that we have been talking about. This would be the, the, the product of those likelihoods and the prior. So this is like an internal model of this system of how it conceives the causes and the signals are jointly distributed out there in the world. <coughs> but then these other scientists, they introduce another model, which they call a recognition model, which is yet another distribution of a joint distribution of i and omega, denoted here by p. And this object kind of... Uh, uh, formalizes how the system interprets the signals. Now the system, upon observing any signal omega, is free to form any belief it wants, any, joint, any conditional distribution of the cause given the signal. So the system is allowed to believe whatever it wants. But it's sampling the signals from some objective distribution. So in the long run, the sample of the signals the system will be experiencing must agree with the prior. So there is a constraint on what is called a recognition model that the joint distribution has to agree on the margin with the prior distribution, but otherwise it's allowed to be uh, arbitrary. So the recognition model kind of summarizes the sample of the signals the system experiences and the beliefs it forms. The generative model is kind of more anticipatory system that tells us how the system perceives the the, the outside world. Those are two different joint distribution. But, and this will be the next slide, a good pair of such joint distribution is, in a sense, to be clarified, as consistent as possible. Okay, so here is a result from machine learning, which is, by the way, I mean, we, we perhaps uh, not very modestly call it a corollary of our result from the, from the, the, the gross part of the model. Uh, here is the result, which has been known in machine learning and, and cognitive sciences. If you solve this problem, if you are look, find a pair of the generative and recognition model, which is as consistent as possible, given two constraints. One is that the generative model is the one that you have thought is, is reasonable, so the prior is from the set of priors that you deemed possible. The recognition model agrees on the margin with the true signal distribution because the recognition model uh, kind of encodes how you are sampling the signals. Uh, and you find such a pair that minimizes this, this Fulbright-Leiber distance, then it spits out two interesting objects. Uh, the, 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 the margin of this uh, generative model, when you integrate over, I, over omegas, uh, will be the optimal prior, or this will be the optimal generative uh, model. And the recognition model, the, 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 the conditional distribution in the recognition models are correct Bayesian posteriors formed 
under degenerative models. So this thing solves two things. It kills two, two, two fly, uh, what is it called? Two birds with one stone. Uh, it, it, it finds the best fit and also solves the Bayesian updating, where the Bayesian updating is not here done as an exercise in, in algebra when you plug it into, into a formula, it's an outcome of an optimization. Yeah, could it be seen that you say proven by variation of arguments uh, in machine learning? It's just that this and the other quantity are, are related by the pullback ladder divergence on the posterior, which is always positive. So it's right, yes, line. yeah, correct, correct, yes. So the, the way it's being proven in, in machine learning is that there is something like a chain rule for, for, for pullback ladder divergence. When you have a chain rule to join distribution, you take the, the, the divergence of the margins and of the conditional ones, and then th th this will be the one line proof. We have arrived to it through the growth process, so we are kind of having slightly different in intuitions for it. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with the <coughs> alternative proof, which is in those other traditional approaches. It's just that we, 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 you know, we, we by, by, by a series of accidents, stumbled to a different path that needs to be solved. <coughs> So the, the the original motivation of this system wasn't did not evolve to distributions. It was involving finding a joint distribution of of uh, signals and causes that fits the data the best. And then once you learn that joint distribution, uh, use this joint distribution to form uh, conditional uh, beliefs over the causes given the observed signal. So this is the true and ultimate goal of this system. The statement is that if the system instead <coughs> is training two distinct models, where models here refer to joint distributions, is doing an exercise that minimizes the kullback liver divergence between those, then the solution of this problem that looks quite different will inform us about the solution of the original problem of our ultimate interest. So the solution of this problem this, the, the optimi this optimizer will give you the, the model that you have been really interested here in, and this optimizer, the optimal control, will give you the correct Bayesian updates with respect to this model. So, uh, in fact, we know, we know how machines operate because people program them, and this is how they do it. They, they, they train two distinct models and they are kind of maximizing some sort of consistency. This is numerically, turns out to be, for reasons that I don't think I fully understand, I understand partially, this turns out to be numerically much easier approach than the, the, the direct attempt to solve this problem. No. So this is... The reason is exactly because of the term that is the difference between this and the other involves the posterior, so right. you have to invert Q, and right. that's just an integral that you can Yes, so, so the, 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 to, to the extent I understand it, Bayesian updating is difficult because uh, you have to find the, the, the marginal distribution. So you have a, suppose you have some, some, some model Q i omega, you would have to f compute the marginal distribution of Q omega that involves an integration over all i's, now, these are not like simple toy examples. These, in machines, these are billions of, of, of these parameters. And, and so any such integration is very difficult. And for subtle reasons that I don't think I will be able to explain because I don't fully understand them, uh, this route, this indirect route, avoids those problems. Okay. Uh, there is some evidence that Rava would know much more about that uh, uh, the, the information between the upper parts of the brain and sensory information is a, is a two-way traffic that the, the, the brain does form some anticipation uh, and then the eye, once observing the stimuli, doesn't have to convey full information because the brain anticipates part of it. The, the, the eye is then sending, or the retina is then sending only the surprising part of the information. So by forming the anticipations and then by informing the the center of the brain only of the surprising part, you are kind of minimizing the traffic in between the eye and the brain. This is my layman understanding of why this approach also might be 
somewhat informative of some biological processes happening in the brain. And so the, the, the reasons I find this noteworthy is that first it takes Bayesian updating seriously. It, here it is an outcome of an optimization. For us it's an outcome of an algebraic formula. Now in the real machine learning they would con put in more constraints. They would per perhaps say that the only thing that the machine can believe are Gaussian beliefs. So maybe the machine can be constrained into, into Gaussian posteriors. You can throw in those additional constraints and then you will not get a perfect Bayesian updating. You will get a constrained base rationality. And I find that also interesting. So I, we are thinking about so what has happened is we were thinking about growth and we have arrived here. Now we are surprised. We have learned about this, this kind of machine learning model, cognitive model. And now we are trying to take the, the cognitive part of it seriously and we are thinking about it. But that's, that's an X project. So we just, I'm just reporting <coughs> what we have learned. Uh, and I invite young people to, to think about it because I, I think it, it might be an interesting area to look into. Uh, let me give you, okay, here is a slide about, about why would the analogy <coughs> hold? Why, why the connection? So there were these like two very seemingly different problems, but mathematically they are the same. Because in the case of, of, of economics, when you are worried about aggregate wealth, what is the aggregate wealth? It's a product of uh, aggregate returns in every period. What's an aggregate return? Mr. I got this much of a wealth at the beginning. This was her return, and then you sum up over, over people. This is the aggregate return, and then you keep on multiplying them. In the statistical problem, you were worried about the likelihood of a sample. What's that? Well, at every given day, this is the prior probability of a cause. Given the cause, this is the probability of that signal that you have observed on the day t. When you sum up over i's, that gives you the marginal likelihood of a sample, and you keep up multiplying that. So in both cases, you are kind of multiplying the same thing, except that here I call it a return, here I call it a likelihood, and here it was a proper normalized distribution, here it was not. But so it happens that even if this is not a normalized distribution, if I kind of treat it and think about it lazily as if it was a distribution, nothing wrong happens. And so then this, this is really why those two things are equivalent. And so then you get these connections that what we call an allocation and return maps into what is called a generative model in machine learning and what we call the path of money, which were some patterns of money circulations, is reinterpreted as a recognition model. Now, why exactly you get those two maps would take a bit more reasoning, which I, I don't know how yet how to effectively verbalize. Yes, yes. So the son of theorem will be, uh, yes. So, so I, I will not go into the full detail, but I will give you where the son of theorem is hiding. So uh, in this part of the talk, I, I, I was attracting your attention to the patterns of money circulation. I call that a path. So that's an empirical distribution uh, that describes how oftentimes a dynasty of dollars, given a finite horizon, was residing in your hands and in a, given a shock, combination of, of, of people and, and, and shocks. And since I have a continuum of those dynasties, some of them are so lucky that they happen <coughs> to be disproportionately often at the hands of productive people or at the hands of the people who are at the given day productive. The penalizing part of that is that there won't be too many such dynasties, so the, the, the number of lucky dynasties are decreasing in time, uh, and, but they also have a higher return, and so there are these two things, and miraculously, both of these considerations are summarized by this kullback library divergence between those two objects. This really now summarizes both the son of theorem and the, the, the growth advantage. Now we do not refer, when we are explaining, we are, we are giving some mathematical intuition for this. So the intuition, the question here is why this kind of consistency considerations have to do with, with growth. And we, 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 we do our best to provide some technical intuition for that. We do not emphasize so much the sum of theorem in this project. But, but it is hiding in, in this part. This is so much I can, I, I can do. Uh, you might 
ask uh, oh, I'm the wrong part of the uh, you might ask what would be the, the, the counterpart of our merit principle in the context of, of cognition and it has a relevant counterpart so let me go over that so now uh, this system a machine or a brain is misspecified so it only had a set of possible priors and maybe none of that set generalized the marginal signal distribution that agrees with the true signal distribution and because the system is misspecified I should not expect the system to perfectly satisfy base consistency so let me, let me, let me clarify uh, this recognition part of the system forms belief given an observed signal omega it forms a belief about the cause it has been optimized, so this is the optimal belief that the system is solving. The probability with which it observes the signal omega is given by the true distribution of this signal, so this is an exogenous object. Since the mis system is misspecified, its anticipation of this distribution doesn't exactly fit the, the, the true world distribution. And so when you take this empirical average of the posteriors, it's not going to agree generically with the, the generative prior over the causes. So in this sense, the system is not base rational, which is good because we want to study deviation from base rationality. But the counterpart of this merit principle says that the, the, the well-adapted system will incidentally minimize the degree of base irrationality, a deviation from, from base plausibility. So let me call a P star i, this empirical average over those posteriors, if it was if it was base consistent, it would be equal to its generative prior. So here is the result. Take this empirical average of posteriors under the optimal policy of the system. Try to minimize the kullback liber divergence between that and all the priors it tries to see. The minimizer will be the, the best fit of the data. So as an a necessary condition of the optimal solution of the system is that it tries to, to, to minimize the degree, the kullback liber wedge between the, the average of posteriors and the prior. So I don't know the economic implications of this yet, but uh, I would think that this is worthwhile to explore because you, you would like to have models that allow you to think about deviation from base rationality, but in a disciplined way, and this says, well, this is trying to be as base consistent as possible, but maybe it cannot be fully base consistent due to, to, to some frictions in the architecture of what it can do. And by analogy with the other model, would you expect that the, the best fit is unique? Uh, yes, yes. Argument? Generically, generically, this will be uh, this will be unique. Uh, uh, well, I. So there might be. So, so one thing which I think we are pretty bad as, as economists, we don't really take seriously the very high dimensions of these problems. We oftentimes, are, our intuitions are formed by these toy examples. In this machine learning, they, they, they really think very carefully about these billions of, of parameters. So now I'm starting to get nervous with my answer of who knows what happens if we have like some very big differences between the dimensions of, of the causes and uh, 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 but okay, I, I I'm not sure what high dimension is. I mean, if there's a zero matter. Yes, yes. So it probably will be unique even with high dimensions, but then it might be very many other solutions that are almost approximately optimal. So then the uniqueness will become a bit of an empty statement. That, that, that might be the, the, the relevant worry. And I don't understand that part of the problem so much. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that's all for this part of the talk, and, and I don't know. So I started at, at oh, I'm almost out of time. Is that no, uh, no, no, no? It's to uh, ten thirty. Ah, ten Very good, very good. So, uh, all right. So we did something about the economic growth and stumbled upon what is called the predictive coding and variational auto and Goethe. And in the process of it, we got more excited about this, and that we hope to be a follow-up project. And uh, this. this by the way, the, the, the special case of, of this problem is rational attention. So if you remove this constraint, if you allow the prior to be 
arbitrary, this uh, simplifies into Russian attention. So if you are, if you have invested into Russian attention, you, you have learned some, some, some information theory and, and, and you are not getting nervous with scooper liber divergences, this open you the path to, to these models and you might have a comparative advantage of, of studying it. Uh, okay, let me. Where is the utility function? In it? Okay, very good. Uh, good question. Let me call the log of a return a utility function, <coughs> and then it becomes a rational attention. Or let me call a log of the of the likelihood the of of of, of cause given omega a utility, and then it becomes uh, a rational attention. So the the incentives. I mean the the equi when I say it becomes a rational attention, I mean there is a mapping, mathematical equivalence. Uh, the, 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 the analog of incentives is hidden either in those returns or in those likely functions. Okay, so you would have to look a little bit for recognizing the rational attention. All right, so uh, I have about a half an hour, and uh, so perhaps the next thing that I will do will be a bit of an improvised little kind of a teaching part when I will be explaining a well-known result by other people, by Kaplan and Dean, and I will tell you a little bit about posterior approach to rational attention. I'm doing it for two things. We somehow miscoordinated with Lumina a little bit and we gave you treatment of rational attention that I think is kind of not representative of how uh, the, the most of the theory think about it, so they are looking at the problem from a different perspective. This perspective has intellectual roots here in Jerusalem. The roots of it is, is Alman and Mashler, and so I think it's symbolic. If, if you haven't been exposed to it, then this might be a good place to be exposed to it. So then, the, the, the biggest challenge might be to to uh, control this system <laughs> because I don't have those in the slides. So and now. Uh, if you know, the, so there will be many of you that have seen this posterior approach, so then you can completely switch off unless you want to witness how I will stumble upon it and will get lost in it. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen it, then, then uh, uh, and, and you are thinking about investing into Russian attention, then, then, then I think uh, this is something worth uh, giving a 15 or 15, oh, no, 10 minutes. So, so far, when we, Lumenta or me, or to some extent Rava, have spoken about Russian attention, then, then the control was, was a stochastic choice of this object. So, uh, given any state theta, we were thinking about what will be the distribution of the action this person takes. But now, when you give me this object, together with the, uh, with the prior distribution, over the states, then I can as well compute a posterior belief that is a conditional state distribution conditioned on the event that you have chosen an action. Let me denote those posterior beliefs by QA. And let me, for a pedagogical reason, assume that the state is binary. I'm doing that, it doesn't, it's, there's no deep reason for that, but what it binds me, that once the state is binary, then a belief is just determined by a probability of, of given, say, to the high state, because then the probability to the low state is just min one minus that. And therefore, I can identify the posterior belief just with the pro posterior probability you assign to the high state, and so this becomes a real number between zero and one, an easy object that allows me to draw pictures. Uh, so a posterior information structure would be a specification of what kind of a belief you hold upon choosing any given action together with a probability distribution that tells me how often you choose any given action. That is, it's a probability distribution over posteriors. So this is a whole system that indexes across all the actions. So it's a distribution over distributions. Right. Now, you are base rational, unlike the system before. And so you have to satisfy, it turns out that you will satisfy what is called a base plausibility condition, which says that if I take an expectation, let me write it as a sum over A, this has to 
equal to the prior. Uh, now, since I'm encoding beliefs as the probability of the high state, that this is the prior attached to the high state. So that's a base possibility. The, the, the intuition, this is for students, really. The, the, the intuition, verbal intuition given for that is that if this was not the case, if you were systematically updating, updating upwards or downwards, then you are knowing something ex ante. And if you know something ex ante, you should also kind of incorporate that into your prior beliefs. Now, that's just a verbal intuition. I mean, if you, if you take the base formula and do some algebra, you get that. <coughs> now, a deep question to be asked, asked by Alman Mashler, uh, was whether it's, it's a converse question. So suppose you find a posterior information structure, some distribution of posteriors that happens to satisfy this base plausibility condition <coughs> given the prior belief. Is it indeed a kosher information structure in that it is generated by some Blackwell experiment, or in this case, conditional choice rule? And the answer is yes. As long as a distribution of posteriors satisfies this condition, then there exists a joint distribution of signals and the, the, the states that agrees with the prior, that Bayesian updating of which generates this structure. OK, so now. So you said given what? Given the, the, the both QA and C? Uh, <coughs> yes, so, give, so yeah. the <coughs> good clarifying question. The posterior information structure is not just specification of those posterior beliefs. It also specifies how often you reach them. So formally, it's a distribution over distributions. So it is indeed, posterior information structure has to tell you these numbers and those numbers for each A. There is a one-to-one -one mapping. If you give me this structure, Bayesian updating gives me this structure. Right. If you give me this structure, I can compute this. So there is a one-to-one. -one. This one has a unique representation here. If you give me this one, I can, re I can, I can figure out this one. There is just yeah, no. okay, so, so this is really just a transformation of variables. This is a transformation of variables. And now I found that new variables and a new space, so as long as you say satisfy this base plausibility constraint, then you found some reason of a, some, some plausible information structure. So now, going back to Russian attention, which was some optimization problem where this was the control of the problem, I can as well formulate Russian attention fun, uh, problem as an optimization with respect to those controls subject to this constraint. So it turns out to be useful. This is why we're talking about it. Uh, so the next thing that I will try to do is to reformulate the objective function, which we have formulated with given these variables uh, in this posterior perspective. So I would like to figure out how happy you will end up being when you reach a particle posterior, taking into account the information cost. So uh, let me scrub the information cost. Let me do something basic. Let me again, just for an illustration, assume that you have a very simple task. So you are choosing an action 0, 1. The state is, is 0, 1. And your job is to, uh, to guess the state. So if you choose an action that matches the state, you get a dollar. If you guess incorrectly, you don't get a dollar. Just a uh, comment on the literature. That th this kind of consideration is also uh, what is done in the so-called information design. Oh, yes, yes. So. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on the intellectual history. I think I, I was told that it is fair to attribute it to, to Alman and Mashler oh, yeah. in the context of repeated games. And, and this has two very strong offsprings. One is Bayesian persuasion or information design, which are also much more tractable once you do this transformation of variables. Turns out that rational inattention uh, uh, is also done these days by theorists as, as, as you are. Uh, in, in, in this uh, formulation, and it will be useful, uh, and we will get to reason why, why it is useful. It will tie. So yesterday I was talking about the property of the optimal choice rule in a complicated dynamic Russian attention, and it turns out that the optimal ones are simple. They have short memory, and I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to explain why is that the case, and it's very difficult to understand why is that the case if you are using this representation. It becomes much more transparent in this representation. That's why, where I'm heading. 
Uh, so I want to first understand how happy you are upon reaching a particle belief. So let me draw a first picture here. Uh, on this axis, I will have a belief that's a probability assigned to, to the high state, so something between 1 and 0. Uh, and let me assume that for some reason you stubbornly take action 1. So if you believe that the state 1 is, is, is completely <coughs> sure, then your payoff will be 1. If you assign probability 0 to the, to the high state, but for some reason you have announced the high state, you are getting an expected 0 payoff, your payoff is linear in your belief, so your, your, your expected payoff as a function of your belief will be a straight line for a fixed action. Now, if you are taking an action 0, then you would be getting expected payoff 1 if you assign 0 probability to the high state and other one. So you would be getting this expected <coughs> payoff. Now, of course, you are allowed to choose an action. So given a belief, if your belief assigns more than half of a probability to the high state, you, you, you choose action one. If, you're, if you, you're, you assign less probability to the high state, then you choose action zero. So the, the, your expected payoff, once you, you, you optimize the action, will be given by, by the maximum of those two lines, or hyperplanes in general. In general, uh, you would take a maximum over some hyperplane, so you would get a convex uh, value function. So it's a V as a value function, but also it looks like a V in this case. But this is the value function which only tells you your expected physical payoffs. We are also worried about the costs. So let me remind you that you are paying Let's start with the entropy cost. So you're paying this, this, this mutual information between A and theta, but let me remind you what it is. It is a difference between the prior entropy and the posterior entropy. Since the posterior is random, I have to take an expectation here. So writing it up together, your total objective is then an expectation over the posterior, because the posterior that you reach is, is now a random variable. Uh, the value function tells you how much of a physical payoff you get if you op a posterior optimize your action upon you reach the posterior. And then I have to subtract this, so it's minus the entropy of a prior plus an entropy of a posterior. And here I close the bracket for the expectation. Now, you don't control the prior. This is a constant for you. It's an exogenous thing, so you shouldn't worry about it. You can as well ignore anything that you don't control. So the, the, the objective is really a simple expectation over posteriors, where you're maximizing this with any distribution of the posterior subject to base plausibility. This is what has become from, from rational attention. Uh, let me plot this function. What was an entropy? Uh, entropy what is an entropy? It, it's kind of a Hill function. So maximizing some of those two things. So by the way, notice you are rewarded for reaching a prior that leaves you very uncertain. Why is that the case? Because you are paying for an information. So if you, if you end up being uncertain, that means you didn't pay that much for an information. You saved some money on information acquisition. That's why there is a plus here. So once you sum up those two things, you get kind of an augmented value function, which won't be a nice function. It will be convex, concave. It will be this kind of a Hill function of this plus this. And OK, you, you start. Um, it will be symmetric for this very nice case. Generally, once I will kind of tweak the incentives, it, it won't have any nice symmetry properties. So let me exploit my sloppy drawing, and let me keep it asymmetric, because that's more more kind of generic case. So let's start with a, with a prior, phi. Uh, and before I optimize, so we will end up optimizing over all posterior information structures. Yes, please. What are the axes? Oh, yes, thank you. So uh, this is <coughs> q, and it runs between 0 and 1. It's a posterior. It's a probability you attach a posterior to a high state. And this is plotting vq plus H, hq. So thank you. That this, this is helpful. Yeah. Any other such clarifying questions? They would be more than welcome. 
All right. So before we get to optimizing, let me take a generic posterior information structure and let's figure out how happy it makes us. So what I'm going to plot is not going to be an optimal information structure. Let me plot two posteriors. So suppose that your belief upon reaching action one would be this, belief upon reaching action zero would be this. I just made them up. You may protest because the, the posterior information structure is not just the value of those two posteriors, but it's also the probabilities of those two posteriors. And I didn't specify them on the picture, but they are hidden in the picture because your posterior information structure has to satisfy base plausibility. So there are two things. The probability of this posterior plus the probability of this posterior has to add up to one. The average of those two posteriors has to equal to prior. So those are two conditions. I have two unknowns. So the, these two probabilities are, 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 are uniquely determined in this picture. In fact, they are determined gra graphically. So the probability of this posterior is the ratio of this line to this line and vice versa. So, so this picture now actually depicts an information structure, understanding the base plausibility constraint. So now let's figure out how happy it makes you. So upon reaching this posterior, your payoff, which now includes the physical payoff and the, 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 the entropy part of it, would be this. If you reach this one, uh, then this would be how much happy you would be. But you want to figure out what's your ante level of happiness, and I'm ignoring this part, which is <coughs> irrelevant. So I have to take an expectation of those two points, where the expectation with respect to frequencies of reaching those two posteriors. How is that done? Well, you connect those two points with a straight line, and you evaluate that straight line above the prior, and this is how happy you are ex ante, given that posterior information structure that you have chosen. Now, is it optimal? Well, can you do any better? Well, the way I wrote it, it's almost optimal, but let's now figure out the optimal one. Well, take a straight line here and, and just use a gravity and, and let, it, let it touch those two hills. Find the tangency point. <coughs> this is a tangency, let me cheat. This is a tangency point. And so then these two tangency points would maximize this quantity would maximize how high this line is above the prior. And so actually, that's the solution. Those two times, yes, please. And this, so the, and the angle of this line can go the other way. And what we can infer from that? Uh, if it goes, yeah, if it's leaning the other way around. Right, so this is the, in this example, if yeah. I was good at drawing, it would be symmetric and it would have been a flat line. Yeah. Uh, now. Which of these two hills will be higher will depend on the incentive. So if I reward you more in the state one, then the right hill will be higher. If I reward you more in the state okay. zero, then the other hill will be higher. So the, 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 the slope will be determined by the physical part of the incentives. <coughs> Thank you. And there is more to be read from that slope that uh, I think you would, would be much better at uh, telling us. Uh, uh, but, but the slope determines the, the, the the, the incentives. In general, if this was not a binary state space, this would be living on a simplex, and instead of a line, this would be in a hyperplane, but like this, this kind of gives you an idea. And so now I almost draw a, a, an, an optimal information structure. So let me pretend that this one is, uh, is, is this tangency point. So let me put a star here claiming it's optimal. Let me put Q0, Q lower bar with a star, and then these two points would then be the optimal posteriors, and again from the base plausibility, I would be able to compute the frequencies of reaching them. Yes, please. Right, so suppose there wouldn't be so suppose there wouldn't be a cost. Yeah. If if there wouldn't be a cost, then you would be doing the same exercise here, but then what would be the touching hyperplane? It would be here and you would be acquiring full information. <coughs> now in information design there might be other constraints to make the problem interesting. It would be de depend on the application. No? And if there is a pair of Right, so suppose it, it, it could be that your prior 
would be somewhere in the part of this, so suppose that your prior would be here, then actually the, 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 the highest tangency point would be just detaching this, this weird value function, the augmented value functions just above the prior, and the optimal thing would be not to acquire any information. So this might happen. This also, this technique would tell you how extreme the prior has to be that you decide not to learn at all. But uh, and uh, this is the usual concavification. Yes, this is I'm 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 this uh, this is my, my, my pedagogical attempt to convey concavification. So if you know the term that probably means that, that you are not learning anything. No no just like let's we, we see like if you by each other's question. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But like I mean what's uh, special about the entropy like uh, I mean does, does it very good question. Does this depend on entropy? And the answer is no, it doesn't depend on the entropy. If I were to replace the entropy with some other concave function, this would still go through. So the thing that it depends on is that the information structure has a structure that you take some concave function of a belief and you are taking the difference between those concave functions values evaluated at the prior and the posterior. The class of such function is called posterior separable and uh, because it then opens the door to concavification, this class has attracted a lot of attention among the theorists. And so it's, uh, the, the, the theorists typically, when they work with Russian attention, they wouldn't commit to entropy, which is ad hoc and, and can be refuted empirically, but would prefer to think about the whole class of, of, of such information structures. And they would say, I don't really care about the exact details of what I'm concavifying. But it's said about the constraint. Yes, so the, 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 but, but that is true for all Bayesian persuasion information design, the original application of, of Alman and Ashmel, that, that, that there's a linear constraint that, that, that I think is, is common to all of those literatures. I'm mentioning this because really the, the, the heart of, of this exercise is in this Bayes plausibility result by, by, by Alman. Correct. Yes. 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 So you the no, but 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 the, the special structure is that it is assumed here that the cost of entropy is some average difference between two functions evaluated between the prior and posterior. That is specific, and there are many other costs that do not have that. Yes. 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 So. The concavity of the function A makes sure that you find the information costly. So because yeah. this is costly, any split is costly. If this wasn't concave, then there would be split that you would enjoy doing. So if you are a person who happens to enjoy acquiring information, then I would represent you with a function which is not uh, everywhere concave. Yeah. But we assume, economists assume that unlike us, real people don't like uh, learning, so, so, so that's why typically with Yes, in terms of the technique, that wasn't uh, that wasn't a, a substantial assumption. Yeah. I just want to understand what the technique is exactly. Because if I look at the maximization problem, this is a linear program because I'm maximizing an expectation with respect to two, subject to a linear constraint, and the average is still something. Mm -hmm. So this is just linear program. Yes, and this so is. So what is what is this program? So what's the relationship? This, I, I don't think I'm, a, so, so there are people, there are good theorists taking the techniques from linear programming and reformulating this uh, as a dual in linear programming. This is the literature where I'm kind of getting lost a little bit. Uh, so indeed this is a linear programming. I guess this has additional special structures. Piotr uh, Dvořák uh, would be a much better person to ask this question. Yes, please. Um, do you know any work that um, when the class function is written, you would say the function so it's not posterior separable anymore? Yes, so there are there, there are there are additional costs. So so Omer Tamus uh, and Coulters have an influential paper that axiomatizes a cost which is not posterior, so it's not even prior dependent. Uh, uh, so it, it, it's not in utility. I, I don't quite understand what mean to be in utility, but there are definitely costs which are reasonable in certain class of problems and which do not have this structure. 
Now there are papers saying that if the person can be very sophisticated about the procedures that she's using, then she will end up behaving as if she had a posterior separable torso. There is a, there's a very large discussion about whether under what conditions this structure of an information cost is, 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 is a reasonable structure to assume. But, but the reason why this is important in Russian attention is that it has strong implication to, to important comparative statics questions. So I have solved graphically this problem for this particular prior. Now I can ask, suppose that the prior was something else. Instead of this P, I would have a P prime. So let me index the rational attention problem by, by the value of the prior. And let me ask, what's the solution of this one? And the answer is, well, the optimal posteriors have to be still those tangency points with the same hyperplane drop from above. And so the problem is the same incentives, but different prior will have a solution that splits that prior, apologies for using that jargon, into the same posteriors. Now, when I'm saying that, I have to be a little careful. What I'm meaning is posterior is a random variable here. When I say it splits the prior into the same posterior, what I mean is that the support of the random posterior is the same. Of course, the frequencies with which I reach those two posteriors have to adapt to, to satisfy base consistency. But roughly, once I know this, this support, I, I solve the problem. So roughly, once you solve it for one prior, you solve it for all the priors in the convex hull of those posteriors. So I mean, you, you, you are, so once you take this original function, then you continue over this line, and then you go back to this function. That yeah, function is called the concavification. Yeah. Right. So in the concave function, it is above Yeah, so the, the important property is what, what Kaplan and Deal have called a, a posterior invariance, which says if you are locally moving around the prior, you are getting the same posteriors. Now let me go back. Uh, uh, you mean your uniform posteriors? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it, it also might be that these functions are <coughs> sensitive to the choice of priors, and then, then this property goes wrong. But let me, let me assume that this, this function is, 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 is invariant with respect to the prior from which you have started. Uh, let me go back to, to, to the dynamic rational attention that I have been emphasizing in my first lecture because I think that's relevant for, for, for empirical or for structural estimation. And I advertise the fact that the em real empirical people, not me, enjoy the fact that the, the optimal choice rule that stems out of that problem is simple in that it has only m short memory. It conditioned only on the last action that you have taken, not on the whole action history, unlike what would have happened with an exogenous information structure when you would have to go through a pain of condition. If you are tracking a Markov process, you would have to condition over a very long signal history. And the reason why that happens is that in the dynamic problem, uh, when you enter a period, you are solving like a period-wise Russian attention problem. Maybe you have entered with this interim belief at the morning of a period. The belief that you end up this at the end of the period is going to be again given by this econcavification exercise where these things would be kind of coming from a Bellman problem so you would be this, this, this value function would be a bit more complicated but some value function you concavify it so the posteriors that you end up with are independent of the belief that you have entered the, the period with and therefore uh, you do condition on, on, your, on, your, on your last action because that determines where this prior was and determines the frequencies with which you enter, uh, reach those posteriors. But otherwise, anything that happened before kind of disappears uh, because you have reached one of those posteriors and, and those beliefs are kind of the, the, the relevant summary statistics and do not carry over uh, anything more. So I'm, I'm a bit sloppy with, 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 with that part, but the, the, the key for for having that nice property of the optimal rules being simple with, with short memory 
is, is this particle property, which then means that it is a robust property in the sense that it does not depend anyhow on entropy, unlike all these logic representations that Luminit and I were emphasizing, these are much less robust because they do depend on the entropic assumption, uh, but the, the simplicity of the rule is, is something that just depends on this posterior separability, or uniform posterior separability. And uh, so, okay, this was just an advertisement for an, an tribute to Alman and Mashler, and I think I have successfully uh, exhausted my time, so that's good because I don't have to, to show you another model and it will be too tired. So, so that, that, that's all I have.